my English name is Julio Sawagish. Tik mek sing don jaba pitish ko ge minado minising chiging gitness gibigachia. I'm here to uh, help share some light on the uh, indigenous education on the just uh, uh, Nokmis uh, perspective. Um, so I'll just share a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up in Chiking, uh, Manitoulin Island, and uh, so my first, uh, I guess, uh, formal education is I went to the day school in Chiking, and as a, you know, just probably maybe one year of that before heading to, uh, before sending me off to uh, the Indian, uh, Indian Residential School, um, St. Joseph's in Spanish. So I was there for seven years, and then, uh, so 1963, the school closed, and I went back to the day school in Chiging, or, or it was called West Bay at the time. So I, I a lot of trauma happened in those schools. Um, children were harmed, uh, and I think some of the, or I believe some of the children were very gifted, you know, with their minds, but... Uh, but many also suffered of trauma that hindered their learning. And um, so I didn't complete uh, grade 8, and I never completed high school. And uh, I left the island when I was 15. I started to wander, looking for my place in life. And um, so in 1967, I met Frank, and uh, so we were married in 68. So looking at you know, what education is, um, you know, I I really didn't have much to offer. But I remember in um, 19, probably 74, maybe even 75, I remember looking out my window and saying, I said, if I could help my people, that's what I'd like to do. But I said, I don't have anything to offer. That's what I said. And so, um, so a few years down the road, uh, my friend and I, we, uh, we hung around the band office. And uh, so we told them we would help. I said, if you want us to do shredding or if you want us to do cleanup, I said, just tell us what we need to do and we'll do it. So, uh, you know, maybe a, a year or so later, they asked if uh, we wanted to do some training. And that we said, sure, we would do that. So we took training, and it was called band, band plan planning. And uh, so we took this training. So, and we did that for us. So that took us into work, starting to do our work with, uh, with, with our First Nation. And uh, so it was a fun time. But still in my heart, I knew that just doing office work was not my uh, forte, so to speak. Um, but I had an opportunity to do more uh, one on sort of one on one. Uh, Inco at that time uh, had a big strike, and so they wanted to uh, offset their wages through uh, what was called Canada Employment at the time, or the EI office, and so they wanted to uh, compensate their their wages what they were getting on EI and. Uh, and through the Canada employment, they were going to offset their, their costs, their employment costs or their living costs. So we, um, so we had quite a few uh, INCO workers. So I took on, I was gifted that, uh, that position to work with these guys. And I had to explain everything about their reporting cards, what was going to happen. They had to be filled out. They had to be submitted on a certain time. And um, and I explained all that to them, and I said, once they were in, I would go drop them off and pick them up so that they would have their money. And I, this is where I felt, you know, this is what I wanted to do, to be helpful, to, to work with people. And um, so that project ran for maybe a couple of months, and, uh, and I just really enjoyed doing that. And, there were some hitches along the way, and I, you know, I said to some of the guys got mad because their checks didn't come in, and I just said, you know, it's it has to do with the office. I said I did everything I was supposed to do, 
and they said, oh, I'm not going to work. And I said, well, you know, that's your choice. I said, and I said, but I will, you know, get it uh, rectified. I'll see what happened. And, you know, they eventually got their checks, but, you know, it's just, uh, I really enjoyed that. And so, um, so I continued to work with my First Nation uh, for the period up to 1984. But I knew in my heart that's not what I wanted to do. So in 1983, there was a posting out at the, for the Friendship Center that there was a position available. So I applied. And um, so just before the Friendship Center's uh, closure for the holidays, I, got, I get a call saying that uh, I got the position if I wanted it. And I was really stunned. And I was stunned because the people from the band office here had said, it was a formality. They already have their person hired. Like, why would you apply there? You know, you're going to have to travel in the winter time. You're going to have to buy new clothes. Like, they're putting lots of negative curves on it. And then I just said, you know what? I says, I'm going to do it. I said, whether or not I get the job, I said, that's okay. So when that day called, that's why I was so stunned. And, um, and of course, I, I accepted. And so in January of 1984... I started working at the Friendship Center. So when I walked through those doors, I just felt like a big blanket wrapped around me saying, this is where I'm going to retire. <laughs> I was just, I don't know, I just felt so good uh, working there. So working there, I, I worked as an employment counselor and I worked in that position for a year. So working with people, getting them job ready, uh, meeting employers, see what you know, types of jobs they had available for uh, for people, and primarily uh, you know Nishnabe people, and um, you know what their uh, qualifications they were looking for, um, you know, all those kinds of things. So I I really enjoyed working there, but the government had closed the um, the community based. Uh, employment counselors down and uh, but at the same time uh, the Indian Indian Friendship Centers had uh, posted a position out of family court workers so I was laid off for a few days and then I applied and uh, <clears throat> so again like I was like uh, really stunned that I was selected for this position and which I applied which I accepted so my time with the Friendship Center um, really helped me to look at, you know, our teachings, the stories with elders, and just looking at, you know, what our people are missing and what I was missing, what I grew up with. I grew up with, with alcohol, violence, uh, the different types of abuses, the harm that was done to our people, you know, why some of our people, uh, you know, left uh, their formal education, um, there were so many barriers of uh, what our people went through and what I went through, which I could relate to. And so up to probably um, in 1989, I really started to connect in who I was. Um, you know, away from, from work, I... Uh, you know, there was opportunities to uh, go to other communities and to listen to teachings, to sit in circles. Um, and we went up to the Sioux, to the Sioux St. Marie at the uh, Garden River. Um, they had uh, a healer there. And we re I really felt so drawn to the teachings, the stories. And, uh, and along the way, I, you know, I... I heard people talking about their spirit name, you know, their clan, their colors, and I thought, like, what does this all mean? So listening to this healer in Sault Ste. Marie that particular time, I felt really drawn. I, I felt this was my moment to, uh, to go and sit with him and talk with him, and I offered him tobacco, and I asked for my uh, spirit name and my clan, and he said he would help me, And but he was from... Uh, from Minnesota. So he said he would call me. So I gave him my phone number and I felt so good when we left there just listening to the stories. So about maybe a month later or so I get a phone call and 
So he's telling me these things, and I didn't uh, know who was calling. And he says, so, he says, you love, you're, you uh, wear the pants in your family. And I said, what? And then he says, you're pretty, uh, you're pretty bossy. I said, who is this? And then he says, uh, he says, you're pretty organized. You want things done in a certain way. And I said, I was just ready to hang up. And I said, who is this? And he starts laughing. He says, it's Adam. He says, I have your uh, spirit name in your clan. He says, your clan is the crane. I said, if you, if you study the crane, he says, you'll understand why I said that. But I reflected back on, on how I was, and I thought, you know, and he was right on to the T how I was, and I thought, oh, my goodness. And, um, but I felt so grounded that day when he called, I thought, my spirit name. You know, and I walked around with that, and, and I really, really looked at it. And then, and then, you know, to have my clan was a bonus, but I understood why I was the way I am today still. So when we look at, you know, the education of our people, um, in my generation, um, I will speak uh, that I'm in the second generation where I will, or maybe the third generation, where I look at my grandfather his generation, be, I, I will say his first generation, then my mother's generation would be the second generation, then I would be the third generation, and then my children would be the fourth generation, and my grandchildren would be the fifth generation. So when we look at those generations, so my generation, the third generation, was, uh, you know, predominantly we didn't have the teachings or we didn't understand um you know, we just lived, we, you know, we did what we had to do, we worked, we uh, provided for our family. But I think that my generation was the awakening of the teachings of the of uh, ceremonies. Um, and I think that's where I really started to really um, feel I belonged, where I belonged was uh, with, you know, in our spirituality of our ancestors. And uh, Frank and I, you know, we, I would come home and, and share those teachings or share some of the crafts that I learned at the Friendship Center. I, I just felt so whole and I felt so awesome. would teach him and I would teach the girls, uh, you know, these crafts. And as, as we journeyed, so when I reflect back on my grandfather's, uh, the first generation was, they were hard workers, but there were also like lots of, uh, lots of alcohol use, uh, lots of violence, and it carried on to my mother's generation, the second generation. You know, there was residential school during those periods. Um, I went to residential school, but she was very harsh. She was very, um, very strict, I guess, at, at that time. But in the period of 19, 1974 with her, we reconciled, and we... Um, we made peace with each other, and uh, from 1974, moving forward, uh, we had a very beautiful relationship as a mother and daughter, grandmother and great-grandmother. And she taught us lots about, you know, things, and uh, just watching her, you know, seeing her in a different perspective from when I was a young girl. But uh, but all of that has helped me to, to shape me who I am today. When we look at the teachings and we look at, you know, the seven grandfather teachings. I um, I look at those seven grandfather teachings that it's all in us, in our spirit, in our being. It's how we work with that, how we live it out. Um, you know, it it also has the dark side, the opposite sides of the seven grandfather teachings. But you know, when we look at the education today, our children are are housed in a square building, square rooms. Um, you know, not much of interaction. Um, so when we look at the third generations of my of my our daughters, our children, um, there was no the history was very negative um, about our people, our ancestors. A lot of the history was done with the European history. Um, there was never any made mention of, you know, our ancestors, the, uh, you know, some of the uh, prominent uh, chiefs, I guess, or, or people, individuals, uh, you know, who might have made, uh, you know, some 
high profile, you know, with uh, of our own people. So when we look at the education or uh, of books of authors, um, it was all the non-native um, content throughout the schools, uh, and I think that our Nishnabe authors were starting to emerge around that time. So I remember when I was working at the Friendship Center, I was with the Alternative School from 1991 to 1997. Um, I think it was in 95 that I, that I made a, a commitment to uh, get my uh, high school diploma. So I started working on that. And uh, so in the English um, credit, I, ha I had to, to read this book, and I can't remember what it's called, but I read it over and over that first chapter to find this one answer. I couldn't find it. So I thought, I must be pretty dumb. I can't even find the answer. So I brought all my stuff back to the school, and I said to the teachers at that time, I says, I cannot do this. I says, I quit. I quit this. I said, I read this one chapter over and over and over. I said, I just cannot find it. So I said, I quit, and I handed everything in. So what I believe, uh, it prompted them that they really listened to what I had to say, and they did their research, they found native authors, Nishnabe authors, and um, so they asked me, they said, Julie, they said, will you do your, will you do your diploma? I said, we found some different literature for the students to read. So I said, okay. So the book was called April Rain Tree, and I went through that book, and I went through the English credit, and, and I got my credits, and I, you know, and I graduated. So what I think it started from there that, you know, our learning is different. Our learning, we have a different style of learning. And I was so, um, so pleased or, or um, happy that the teachers that we had at that time, they saw what, what was lacking for our students, you know, and what they needed. And, and they, uh, you know, they searched that out. So I think there are teachers who are very caring, who understand like that we have a different way of learning or how we can relate to our own Nishnabe authors. So I, you know, I, I graduated uh, that year. So when we look at, at education, I think education is not only should be in school, our education is also outside because when you look at our ancestors of long time ago, when they when they roamed this land, they hunted, you know, and they used the animal. Everything in that animal was used. They never wasted anything. We looked at all the trapping styles, you know, we looked at what the women did, the creativity that they did in, you know, when they made the when they made their garments, uh, all of those things, their creativity. So when, uh, when we look at today, now we move forward to where we are, 2019, is that um, our children don't even know what it's like to go camping. Our children don't know, like most of them, I'm not saying all of the children, but most of them don't know uh, what it's like to go fishing, uh, what it is like to lay, you know, under the stars, to look at the stars. They don't know what it's like to uh, maybe even have moose meat, beaver meat, any of those, you know, the wild game and fish. So I think it's time for our children to go back and experience that. You know, say maybe a week of, uh, of um, outdoor land-based teachings so that they could experience that. And for all the seasons, because every season has its, uh, has its gift in, in what they provide. Um, so when our children could experience that and then relate it back to when they go back to school to be able to carry on what it's like to uh, maybe tan moose hide, to, uh, to skin a moose, to skin a beaver, how to cook fish, how to smoke fish, maybe even grow a garden, watch the garden grow throughout the, the you know, the summer, um, you know, starting at home, uh, do this at home as a home project with the school, to be able to make a report back to the school with pictures or video, um, 
we have so much technology today that uh, you know there's so much that we could uh, the children could use to to show you know what they uh, what they could make or or do during the summertime there's so much uh, that you know that we could teach children you know how to sew uh, even the boys you know they could learn how to sew they can do beadwork you know what does it mean to be in ceremony uh, what does it mean to be, you know, in powwow uh, ceremony, regalia making? There is so much opportunity that our children could learn, you know, what, how it is to make, uh, to make lots of different crafts, you know, to, to drum, to learn songs, to travel, you know, to understand what is a bundle, what makes up a bundle, you know, to, to kind of wave their their precon their preconceived thinking that you know that only certain people you know carry ceremonies but we are all ceremony people i think that's what i like to stress lots is that not only certain people are i don't like the word traditional but ceremony people or people who who uh carry uh knowledge and ceremonies you know a lot of everyone could be you know carry those in their own way so I think, you know, to go along with the formal education of the school system is, you know, if, they, um, if we could incorporate our way um, in communities, even in the cities, um, you know, what the ceremonies are, you know, what it is, um, you know, to bring in people who, who may, um, may know how to uh, maybe cook uh, moose or fish or make uh, scone all of those different foods and, um, you know, to taste different foods that we have, you know, it's so much, uh, it would be so much um, positive learning and so much uh, pride in who they, who, how they would turn out to be. Also to, um, so when we look at in who they are, you know, with their, you know, when they, uh, have their Anishinaabe and those when their clan, they would find uh, their uh, their spirit so much lighter, and you know how they would live their life would be much more clear. But everything that we do in life, it's um, we do it in that good way. We do uh, we walk in that good way, you know, always to you know help others to you know. To have a better understanding of, uh, you know, this way of life of our ancestors, it's simple, but it's also very, uh, it's also very struggling for people. It's, it, they might even find it hard in that way. But, but to balance it out in the way in how our lifestyle today, but we can also, you know, live our, the way of our ancestors, as well. So you know, the Indian are. Uh, the Nishnabe education um, perspective is uh, it's so um, it's so broad. Um, so many uh, different people have gifts, uh, have uh, ceremonies, and teachings, stories that I think in you know communities across the country. Um, you know we're so uh, today it's really open to uh, you know to bring elders in, you know, knowledge keepers, like there's so much avenues that our, our people could learn rather from, you know, look at elementary, high school to post-secondary. It's very accepted. So a lot of that is indoors. Like I said earlier, you know, if, it, if they could bring it to the outdoor, I think it will enhance their learning. It would, uh, to be able for them to experience uh, hands-on, how to make a fire, how to make a, a teepee, how to make a lean-to, how to snare, how to go fishing, how to, you know, so many little things to identify medicine plants, identify the trees. It's like us, you know, when we have our Nishnab and Oswin, everything in creation has a name. So when we get connected, our spirits get connected to everything in creation and that they even talk to us if we pay attention to them. Um, so there's so much to learn. Learning is is ongoing. 
Frank and I, we, we always learn uh, from creation, uh, like the wind, you know, the air, the sun, the trees. You know, they, we learn so much from them just by watching. Even the birds, they're, even the birds tell us, you know, when things are changing. You know, we, even the earth, mother, mother, you know, Shkakmakwe, even she's telling us, you know, things are shifting. So all that type of storytelling, you know, for our children to pay attention to, you know, they would learn so much. They would have a better understanding of what they are learning in school, you know, when they have the, if they could have that experience. So there's so many things. Uh, I can't even. I'm starting to uh, exhaust. I guess what what I would like to say. There's so much I would like to share, but I think when we can. Uh, teach them that you know that they they have a good spirit that they, you know that they are, they're learning and that uh, you know they're the ones who are going to be teachers in you know in the next generations to come and that our ceremonies need to continue on so you know if we really teach them these things then for sure we know that our ceremonies will be carried on our language will be carried on you know all of that so I think that when I expire I'm going to expire happy because I know that <laughs> that um, the our stories and teachings and ceremonies and our way of life are going to be carried on. You know, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, you know, I was uh, very fearful that uh, that we were going to lose all of this of who we are as Nishtabe people. Um, so I think you know that with all of that, um, that you know, we still have a lot of work to do. You know, as Mishomsak uh, and Nokmasak, um, we have so much work to do, and uh, and we have a lot of good young people. You know, um, the third generation uh, of young people. Uh, you know, they have a responsibility to you know to uh, pick up the teachings and the ceremonies and you know this way of life, and then f and continue to help the next generations to come. So uh, I have a uh, a very strong belief that you know we will never uh, we will never die as Nishnabe people. Our spirits will live through our through our generations. Um, you know what everything that uh, that makes up in who we are, and I think we make our our ancestors really really happy that uh, that we will continue to be who we are as Nishnabe people. Uh -huh. Thank you.